thanks for coming. Uh, the idea of this talk is that I'm going to talk about uh, suffering in games. Uh, yeah. Uh, so specifically, I'm going to try and talk to you, I'm going to try to convince you to put more suffering in your games. Sorry. So first of all, a lesson from the Olympics. The Olympic Games are watched by literally billions of people. It's the only sport, uh, sporting event uh, what, I guess I guess the World Cup has more uh, more significance, but other than that, the Olympics is the most significant uh, sporting event in the world. And I think competing in the Olympics is also nothing like uh, competing in a video game, right? So for the athletes uh, and for the spectators, and especially for me, it's all about the suffering. <laughs> this is Jesse Williams from America, who was the favourite in the high jump this year, uh, but he didn't medal. There's him laying down on the on the track and crying. There's a fencer from South Korea, Shin Lam, who was uh, she lost her semi-final. It's a really tight uh, match with multiple restarts right at the end. And she sat while she was waiting on appeal. She sat and cried uh, on the track. There's Lewis Smith uh, from the UK, who was knocked out of the gymnastics uh, qualifiers. And Gemma Howell. The judo got DQ'd after grabbing her uh, opponent's leg in the final. I think this year was special because we saw an unprecedented number of people getting silver medals and then crying tears of sadness. Uh, this is Purchase and Hunter from, from England who uh, narrowly missed out on gold in the rowing. And you think, nobody cries when they come second in a video game, right? No, nobody lies down on the ground and cries. Why not? There's Liu, 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 Liu uh, Xiang, who's the uh, 2004 Hurdles World Champion, uh, who was injured in Beijing in front of the home crowd, uh, and in his, basically his last competitive chance in London. And he was injured again in the finals, and he hopped all the way to the finish line uh, on one leg. It wasn't his fastest performance. Uh, he didn't cry, uh, but I'm pretty sure he was suffering the whole way, and for me that's what makes this the iconic image of this year's Olympic Games. Valerie Borchin from Russia collapsed during the race war. Right? Why do people compete in the race war? It's not fun. It's not particularly interesting. It's not enjoyable for the athletes. It doesn't make a full exploration of the implications of its rule set. It doesn't make you a lot of money. You just walk so hard that you nearly die. Right? And a billion people watch you. <clears throat> People ever having fun when they run long distances? Is this guy having fun? She having fun? How about him? <laughs> I think the old Olympic uh, uh, video games that we had, you, you used to have a lot of them, and they had a ride. You know, we play track and field or summer games. The way that you run is to either hammer a button really fast or waggle a joystick really fast. You do it so, so fast your arm hurts. There's no pleasure in it, right? The, the, the pleasure, I guess, more, more precisely, is in the pain. It's in having your friends watch, watch you while you injure yourself pressing a button. <laughs> I think modern video games, by and large, uh, do their best to protect you uh, from that kind of suffering. I think we've come at it as a kind of an engineering challenge uh, to systematically uh, eliminate frustration and pain and thereby increase the amount of time uh, that people are willing to spend with a game. So it, it's not just that games are easier, although they are. I mean, you can make an easy game where there's no hand-holding, uh, no explanation, no failure, no suffering at all. Uh, or you can make an easy game where there was a lot of, a, a lot of sorry, a lot of suffering as well. Uh, but it's, it, to me, it's that games these days are more comfortable. Right? There's less discomfort. So my worry is not that games are getting too easy. I think easy games can be wonderful. Uh, my worry is that we're losing this dimension of pain in games, whether they're easy or hard. I think, I think we enjoy suffering when we play a game. So there are a bunch of, of instrumental reasons uh, why you might, you might enjoy pain in games. So, so what's good about suffering in games? That's, that's the first question. All right, so number one, when you suffer in a game, it makes failure matter. If, if, the, if the failure condition is something that you don't enjoy, uh, then you're, you're going to get, it's going to matter more to you how well you did and you're going to try harder. So in Counter-Strike, for example, it's boredom. Boredom is the stick. If you, uh, if you lose, it's a penalty, uh, 
that you have to sit and wait everybody else, uh, watching everybody else play. Uh, and I think, I think the much more wide, widely used one is frustration, right? So people uh, send you back, there's a loss of progress, that's a punishment for, for not playing well. So that's a way to make failure matter. Number two is it makes success matter if there's suffering in the game. So if you've really suffered heavily, if you've, if you've sort of been working really hard and you haven't been enjoying yourself and you get to the end, there is this kind of sweet feeling of uh, relief and victory. I think when you get to the end of V or Hexagon or Quap, uh, for the first time you feel like this huge weight has been lifted. So it makes success matter as well. And there's also this sense of challenge, right? So. So there's this idea that there's a certain glory in taking on a serious challenge, and people will take on a task just because it's challenging, and for no other reason. I mean, if you look at competitive ca uh, cup stacking, or in this case, uh, uh, hot dog eating competitions, uh, that's just challenge for the sake of challenge, right? So each of those reasons, I call them an instrumental reason uh, for, for having suffering in a game. And what I mean is that the suffering makes the game more pleasant in some other regard. It's a means to an end. But I don't think that instrumental reasons are the only reasons to have suffering in a game. So this talk is like a love letter to games that put you through hell just for the sake of it. Uh, to the different kinds of suffering that we love, uh, not just because they improve some other aspect of the game or make something enjoyable or give you relief at the end, but because we enjoy the suffering itself. Okay, so the most obvious form of suffering is pain. I want to say, pain is not just for masochists, right? Pain is for all of us. So here, I'll give you some examples of pain in games. This is James Bond, right? So in this example, an electric shock is added to the controller. It's a way of making failure more consequential, right? So Bond is trying really hard to win this game because he gets a very strong electric shock uh, whenever he doesn't do well. I think most people have played some version of, of this game Australia, we call it slaps. People here call it slapsies or red hands. Can I see who's played this? Yeah, almost everybody, right? So for those of you who haven't played it, the idea is that you're both holding your hands like this. One person's on offense and the other one is on defense. If you're on offense, you're trying to slap the other person's hands as hard as you can. They're trying to pull their hands away at the last second. But if they if they mess up and they don't, if they pull their hands away before you go for a slap, they're allowed one free slap. So this is really a game that is about uh, causing pain to somebody else and feeling pain. There's many versions. There's, uh, there's one where you try to stomp on somebody's feet. Uh, th these things are really universal. As you see, everybody in the room has played this game. And we also have these games these, that are about challenge, about subjecting yourself to some horrible, painful experience just for the sake of it. So in this video, uh, this is Glozell. Glozell is taking the cinnamon challenge, uh, wherein the sole rule is that you have to eat a big spoon of cinnamon. That's the game. All right, so here's the cinnamon, all right? All right, here we go. game on YouTube, right? You, you take the cinnamon challenge and you film it. So pain is not the penalty for losing this challenge, right? There's no way to do the cinnamon challenge that you don't have pain. Pain is integral to it. It, it, is, it is everything about the cinnamon challenge. Uh, just like, uh, you know, I, I suppose just like slaps. So this is a kind of aesthetic of pain. And this brings me, I, I, want to, I want to talk a little bit about what I do when I'm designing games. Often when I start designing a game, I start thinking about the aesthetics of the input, right? So specifically, I start by trying to think about what would be a way of interacting with the computer that would be good, that would be interesting, even if there wasn't a game to go along with it, even if the computer is switched off. And you think about it, most sports pass that test, right? So when people play tennis casually, they don't enforce rules. They just hit the ball to one another. And the game is considered to be going well so long as uh, the ball doesn't go out of bounds and you have to go and get it. Uh, people play catch, I guess, is, is, is the simplest thing. Uh, they play catch with the rules. You're just throwing the ball to each other and you're enjoying them, right? And they don't do it because, you know, they're trying to improve their baseball skills necessarily. Uh, they just do it because they like to catch, right? The feeling of catching is the entire game. I think modern video game controls often feel okay, but they aren't very interesting to hold and interact with if there isn't a game attached as well. 
So I'll take an example. When I'm bored, I often find myself drumming my fingers uh, on my desk, on my keys, on the keyboard. Right? I ask myself, well, why do people do that? What's, what's the appeal of that? It doesn't really feel pleasant. Um, but it does seem to just be a little bit in entertaining in its own right. right. So I wanted to make a game that you would control by drumming your fingers on the keyboard uh, with, the, with the idea that being anything you add on top of that is starting from a foundation of being satisfying or uh, interesting in some sort of way. So I made this game, Clop, where you, you can make a horse run by drumming your fingers on the keyboard, H-J-K-L, H-J-K-L. And although it might not be the exact optimum way to play the game, if, you, if you're just drumming your fingers, you can get the horse running fast and, and fairly naturally. When I made GURP, I had this idea that it might be fun to stretch your, your, your hands over the whole keyboard and kind of contort your hand into weird shapes, kind of difficult, painful shapes. And it's not too far from there to start thinking about games where the input would be, be painful. You could have a painful uh, aesthetic of input. The core mechanic doesn't need to be pleasurable. In the, in the cinnamon challenge, the core mechanic isn't pleasurable. So I think we can have video games too, where the basic control scheme would be painful. <laughs> so this picture is from Japanese fans of Armored Core uh, 5. They felt that the controls were really too complicated. So one of them posts this picture, uh, where this is like a critique of the game. This is the only way to reach all the buttons. But I think it looks amazing, right? You know, ergonomics is boring. I would love to have a kind of anti-ergonomic game where you try to play for as long as you can, your hand is kind of clamping up. It'd be like a marathon endurance challenge. And that would be like, you could tell your friends, I played for, for three hours, and you know, I had to go to hospital afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> All right, frustration. We've done pain, frustration. We've, we've all, I think for a long time, been talking about the relative merits of difficulty and uh, difficult games versus easy games. Uh, games were hard and they were short when they were made by fewer people and when you had to play, pay for each uh, playthrough because it was in an arcade. And they got easier as they transitioned into the living room and as the audience uh, started to include people uh, who were less uh, committed to gaming. Uh, Jesper Yule opens his book with this example from the game Meteos. Right? So he says that he bought this game and for the first time in his life he finished the game in one go without failing even once. Right? And his experience of it is that he felt ripped off when he got to the end. He was angry. And so he goes on to consider in his book like a whole bunch of ways in which uh, failure, which is having your goals frustrated, can contribute value uh, to a game. And I think that's good. I think that's, that's, that's all right. But I think frustration can be nice in a game even when it's not attached to failure. So here's a good example. So in Monkey Island 2, you spend all this time trying to get uh, this piece of a map that keeps on blowing away at the last second. And finally, you track it to this cliff. And you've had to go and get like a fishing rod so you can get it that's hanging off the bottom of the cliff. Right, so here he goes. He's going to finally get this map. Which is inspiration for Gert, by the way. As it comes up. <laughs> that advances the plot, right? So it's not actually a failure state. It's a success. But you get this beautiful little pang of frustration when the bird flies off with the map. I'm sorry if you came to my talk at GDC. I never get tired of showing this clip, so I'm going to show it again. I put two success conditions in GURP. You can win it. Choosing the GURP. All I gotta do is grab the present and we'll be done. No. Oh my gosh, that bird can land on the present. What? <laughs> what? Are you kidding me? <laughs> what? <laughs> That's bull crap. <laughs> I just spent 20 minutes doing this and the bird wins? <laughs> I should say that he still wins, right? I mean, he gets to the end and he logs a high score. Uh, but, you know, this is about just having frustration for frustration's sake. And I've started even putting elements in my games that we could describe using the technical game designer's word, bullshit. <laughs> I would put bullshit in my games, right? So you get to the top of the hill in clocks, pretty hard. Not many people have gotten there, so I'm going to just show you what happens, right? You're working hard, you're getting up the top, and then I put in this thing that's just deliberately unfair. <laughs> that's how you have to win clock. All right, confusion. 
this is how testing works at AAA studios like Valve, right? And presumably many AAA studios. They get a group of players to play through the game and they document everything that they did. Maybe they've got like analytics, it's like computers measuring it. And the idea is that the testers, uh, if you just ask them what they thought about the game, uh, they'll tend to give you bad advice. But if you watch what they're doing and you really sort of process what they're doing and analyze it, you can get uh, good advice. You, know, you can get good information uh, by seeing it through a designer's eye, right? And I think that that makes sense, totally. Like, you know, I can understand why you do that. Um, but I hate the kind of choices that it seems to, to lead them to, right? So this is from Valve's uh, des uh, developer commentary from Half-Life 2, right? So there's this guy, uh, one of their testers out of presumably a large group, uh, who kept on turning right at this junction over and over again. Now, after half an hour, he had kept coming back to this spot, turning right, half an hour, right? And they said, this, that was a compelling argument for the removal of the maze-like segments in the game. And now, I just think that is totally wrong, right? I think it expresses the wrong understanding of the relationship between the developers and the player. They should be pleased that he turned right over and over again for half an hour. That means they tricked him into getting lost, right? <laughs> and I don't think you should just assume that the player feels bad about that either. I mean, people, people love getting lost in mazes. This is why we have the concept of a maze. They like getting confused. They like not knowing what to do, right? Way before people had computer games, they grew hedge mazes. Now, hedge maze, after all, is not a guided experience. Uh, the idea is it's, in, it's an environment you can get lost in. That's the whole point of it, right? So going back to my earlier points, fun to be lost in a maze, even without the video game attached, even with no computer, even with no guns, even no, with no head crabs, with no animatronic woman, uh, it's, it's something that people enjoy. So the idea that you have to remove it, uh, the, the maze-like elements when somebody gets lost seems completely uh, wrong to me. But here's another example. I feel strongly about this because I loved Sword and Sorcery. I thought it was uh, it's really one of the best games I've played. But it has this bit where you go to the edge of the lake uh, in the dream realm, and the path comes to an end. You come to the, the end of the, to the edge of the lake. But before you have any chance to feel confused or turn around, not know what you're doing, this little helper te text appears, uh, believe, right? It's a wretched little <laughs> tool tip. And I think about how amazing the experience would have been if I'd wandered around for an hour, not knowing what to do, if I'd gone back, if I'd walked over my, my path, if I'd felt frustrated, and then after all of that, I decided to give it a shot and try walking on the lake, right? That would have been probably one of the best moments in any video game ever. But as it is, I've just been told what to do, and I just, I just do it. And you can contrast it against Proteus, right? Which, in which being confused about what you're supposed to do is the core part of the experience. Like that's the entire experience. You wander around the world, uh, and it plays with you. It doesn't tell you where to go or what you should do. There's no text, there's no UI, there's no believe. Uh, and there are, these just, there are these little animals, I guess, that run away from you. There are mysterious lights shining in the, in the distance. And, and you feel intrigued and you want to play in, in the world. Confusion. Let's push it a little bit further. Oh, yeah. Nauseating games. Okay, so little kids have these games that are just about grossing each other out uh, and trying not to vomit, right? So one of the ones that they have is like, you get the biggest spoon in the kitchen and then you get everything out of the cupboard and you try to load up the spoon with, with everything, take turns to put more on. And you sort of, you're, you're daring each other to put as much on as possible. And if anything spills off the spoon, that person has to eat the entire thing, right? Or you, you have Kiss Chasey, where the girls uh, chase the boys and try and kiss them and the boys run away because girls are gross. Uh, and then you've got this kind of thing like Halloween, it's like put your hand into something disgusting. That's something that kids love as well. I think there are whole parts of the internet as well that are just oriented to finding ways to, to make people feel nauseated as a kind of a game, right? So with that in mind, I've been reading up on the various ways you can make people feel sick with video game uh, technology. I get motion sick if I, I don't ever get motion sick, I should say. I don't get car sick or anything like that. But Wolfenstein 3D makes me motion sick. And, you know, it's not that great of an experience. Um, I have to stop playing and lie down. I don't feel good about it. But I think the reason I don't feel good about it is it's, it's not really the point of the game, right? Uh, it's not part of the game. I think you could easily make a gross-out game that worked in this way, but deliberately, and I think people would love it. 
So there's this thing called the optokinetic reflex, uh, where the eye is forced to switch between points of focus a lot, which is a really reliable way of inducing motion sickness. So basically you feel motion when your eye jumps from one thing to another, you do it a lot, you feel sick. You could really easily work it to a game, it's easy to make that. If I made you sit here and watch this for too long, some of you would start to feel sick. <laughs> um, maybe I should. Uh, I think it's kind of sad that that's not used in games, it's completely trivial to implement. You can do that on Atari 2600. Now a while ago I was experimenting with this sort of thing, this is a sort of little, uh, not even really a prototype of a falling block game. Um, <laughs> There's also this other thing where you, you perceive uh, motion of other objects with what's in the center of your visual field and then you perceive your own motion with what's outside in the periphery of your visual field so if you make them not match up that's a good way of making people feel sick as well. <laughs> and that's how this kind of image works as well, right? So linear gradients of brightness are perceived as motion so if you put them in the corner of someone's eye, I don't know if that's, that makes me feel very weird to look at. Humiliation. So in Halo, <laughs> players teabag each other, right? So you might, you know, they, for those of you who don't know, when, when you've killed somebody and they're incapacitated, you go and you crouch repeatedly over their face as a humiliation. And you, you could see that as being a kind of a, a primitive sexual dominance maneuver, but I don't think it is. I think the characters are asexual. I think it's basically just taking advantage of the other guy and humiliating him for fun. Mortal Kombat has these fatalities, these uh, humiliating uh, finishing moves. Um, you might think that is for the, uh, for the pleasure of the winner rather than the, the pleasure of the, the loser, but I don't think that could be right. It's not, it's not just in there so that you can do that to another player. The, the computer does it to you as well, right? And I assume the computer is not taking any particular pleasure in, uh, in doing these moves to me. I'm supposed to be enjoying it as a player, even on the losing end. Right. This is why in Quop, when you lose, you get a ribbon for being a participant. And it says everyone is a winner, even though you're clearly not. In the iPhone version of Quop, I made these uh, newspaper headlines. And in Quop, there's this character called Sherrod who's constantly mocking you. So it brings me to a broader principle of game design that I want to talk about a little bit. I think this is really uh, super important. So the reason I'm, I'm cataloging these various dimensions of suffering, uh, there's a reason for it. And why, why, would, why would frustration uh, feel good, right? Why, why would confusion be nice? Why would humiliation be nice? I think one really important reason is that it represents the developer playing with the player. I think a lot of the time when we seek to remove suffering from games, uh, we're, we're operating under this, this kind of attitude that the game has to work in an engineering sense, right? If the player is confused, or if the player doesn't know what to do, they'll get turned off and they'll lose interest and they'll stop playing the game and that represents a kind of engineering failure. So that presents a kind of a model of the relationship uh, between the player and the developer, where the developer is like a tour guide or a teacher for the player, like a mentor who tells you how to stay interested in the game. And for me, that's a kind of a warped way uh, to see the relationship between uh, the developer and the player. I think when you're developing a single player game, you're there to play with the player, you're standing in for player two. I think that is the correct attitude. Well, what does that mean? Well, you think about what kinds of play are there in two player games. That, that is a really good guide for this. So sometimes you cooperate with the other player, uh, but more often you fight the other player. You trick the other player, you kill him, you harm him, you thwart him, uh, you're frustrating the other player, you're defying him, you're embarrassing him, you're deliberately confusing him, and so on. I think often what it means to play uh, is just to fight in a way that's constrained with a certain set of promises. So the promises are like this. Now, I won't kill or seriously injure you, and you won't kill or seriously injure me. And anything else that we do apart from that is play, right? That's how cats play, it's how dogs play, that's what boxing is. But I think when you go on to promise more than that, or too much more, you know, I won't hurt you at all, I won't frustrate you at all, I won't confuse you at all, uh, then you're making the 
the, you know, you're making the, the touch, the touch football. This is the touch football of video games. This is the flag football of video games. This is the softball of video games. I think you should make the real football of video games. I love it when games talk smack, right? So, so if you die too many times in Devil May Cry 3, you get this message. Easy mode is unlocked. And it's subtle, but it's just telling you you suck, right? <laughs> uh, not many people know this, but I made the, um, the room names for V. Uh, and so in this infamous room, right, when I was making the names for these rooms, um, I had to play the game, Terry had set it up, and uh, I had died here you know, 400 times. <laughs> and I figured everybody else would die there 400 times as well. So when you first get to that room, it doesn't really make sense. Easy mode unlocked, what do you mean? I just got here. And then after you've died you know, 300 times, it starts to dawn on you. I knew from co -op that <laughs> players will always try to find the easy way of playing a game, uh, even without easy mode unlocked, even if it's embarrassing or undignified, right? So in, in co -op, people try and like, tap the buttons as fast as you can and he scoots along on his knee and they think that they're kind of like defeating the game systems by doing this and they don't, they don't even feel embarrassed about it. Uh, so in club I decided, you know, this, this should have this easy mode unlocked moment. If you try to drag yourself along with the horse's front feet for too long and you don't move the back ones, then the back ones die from disuse and you're, you're in lame horse mode and you have, to, you have to play the rest of the game that way. So it's partly about a little mean trick trick for the player, it's partly about uh, humiliating the player for, for, as a sort of a punishment uh, for trying to, to take it too easy. But I think also in this case it's showing that as a developer I'm attending to what you're doing as a player, right? I, I'm, I'm, the game is reacting to how you're playing the game. I think it helps to establish the idea in the player's mind that you're playing with them rather than establishing an environment for the player to play with himself. I think, I think that's why we find uh, achievements uh, like Xbox achievements appealing. I mean, obviously, the, you know, there are a lot of problems with, with achievements, um, and you know, we can talk about that, but uh, the appeal of them is that the game takes something that you did, whether it's get to the end of a game without firing a gun, or uh, you know, in Red Dead Redemption's uh, tie up a woman, uh, on, put her on the, the railroad tracks, you get an achievement for that. This is a way for the player to feel like what they're doing matters because it's being, uh, it's being noticed. One way to play with the players uh, is, to, is to play with their expectations. So this is a neat little prank from Monkey Island 1. And this, I should say, is in a, in a period of time when there are a lot of Sierra adventure games where you could fall off a cliff very easily and then you would die. So they, uh, they did this. Like, oh no, you know, you're screwed now. This is the first time you've seen a game over a screen. And he goes, rubber tree. <laughs> so frustration without failure. When you load up Karateka on the Apple II, you get this loading screen. But if you if you messed up and you put the disc in uh, in the drive upside down, you get that. <laughs> now I think if you employed Valve's testing methodology, you'd have found that some players got confused at this point, right? And they turned their computer off and on, or they turn their disk drive upside down, maybe they called the support line. And Valve would say that that was a compelling argument for removing the feature. There's hundreds of ways to play with the player. There's another one of my favorites. This is one of my favorite games of all time, IK+. Plus. You're playing, it's like, it's a karate game, you've got joysticks, that's how you play with it. If you reach over and press T on the keyboard uh, while you're playing with your friends, that's what happens. Their pants fall down. It doesn't add anything to the game except a sense of playfulness and a kind of a connection between the player and the developer. And that is, I think, ultimately what we can do with suffering in games. So you might say to me, like having heard all that, all right, so, so playing with the player is all well and good, um, but suffering is not an enjoyable way to play with the player, right? Uh, you might think that people enjoy frustration maybe, but do they really enjoy feeling nauseated? Maybe not. So the next thing I want to say is, who cares, right? Who cares if the players like it? I think if you're really serious about playing with the player, if you're serious about being player two, to the player's player one, then you should just feel like as the developer, you should take some pleasure in the suffering of the player, right? Not just as a sadist, but as player two. That's what we do when we're playing with people. 
I'm going to issue one last little provocation here as a, as a, as a challenge. So Little Richard, uh, you know, one of the pioneers of rock and roll, uh, was not selling so well to the white American market. And you can make a, a catalogue of things they didn't like about it. It was uh, louder than what they were used to, it was faster, there were shouted vocals, it was in a style they weren't familiar with. Here is his most famous song, just a second. All right, Pat Boone came along, right? He was aware that people found Little Richard too upsetting, too difficult, so he made a clean version of a number of his tracks. Right, here's his version. It doesn't have those difficult qualities. Oops. And people, <laughs> people loved it, and his record sold really well, right? But I think people would agree now that that's not the most, uh, the most interesting or the best way to go about making good music. I think when you remove an element from a game just because it causes confusion or frustration, you might be making the Pat Boone version of your own game. <laughs> and people will love it, maybe it will sell really well, but maybe you just shouldn't care so much about what people will love, right? Maybe you should just be like doing your thing, leading opinion, and not kind of tailoring everything to people's pre-existing tastes so much. Well, well, well. <laughs> I wonder if uh, Marcel Duchamp uh, would have put a tutorial in his video games, if he had been around to make video games. I think, you know, like so many artists uh, since the beginning of the modern uh, era, the point of his artwork was to confuse and shock people. He wouldn't have focus tested his game. He wouldn't have removed sections that were confusing. He would have viewed that as the kind of biggest possible creative success. Max Ernst made these crazy surrealist alien landscapes there. His way, he got a, a wet sponge, he put paint on it, and he pressed it onto the canvas, and then he kind of used the shapes that came out of that. You think, would it, would it have been improved with little bits of helper text? You know, weird play, <laughs> skeleton, food, penis. Believe. <laughs> so, so this is a kind of appeal, this is an appeal that I'm making to you guys. Don't water down your games. I think art should be difficult, it should be painful at times, it should be offensive, it could be nauseating. And I think games have the opportunity to be more painful, uh, more nauseating, more confusing than art, music or the written word, because they ask more from the player. I don't think that's a problem. I don't think that's a reason to try to engineer them to be more comfortable. I think it's the best thing about games. And so just to finish, I'll say, don't make the easy listening of video games. <laughs>